Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Life Market Analysis Macro Style. That is indices, commodities, crypto, and forex. My name is Carl Kaluva. I'm the market analyst over here at Think Markets, and it's a pleasure to be with you. As I said, as we tour the globe, try to find those key charts, key trends, and key themes that impact your day-to-day -day portfolio. And hey, you never know, we might even find a trade or two while we're there. Um, if you're watching this recording on YouTube and you're wondering, hey, Carl, what the hell? You're supposed to be streaming this. I was waiting <laughs> diligently on a LinkedIn, on YouTube, on a Facebook, or on Twitter, uh, and I didn't see you. It's because we have had uh, some technical difficulties over here. Uh, I'm not going to blame certain elements of the uh, the Think Markets IT juggernaut, uh, but no doubt we'll have that rectified for our next catch up. So that's why uh, we're recording only today. Uh, but for the people that are here on Zoom, and that's a, that's a pretty good plug for Zoom. I'm going to send out the links every week. Register for the Zoom session. It gets you in no, no matter what. Uh, but we can take requests on anything macro, and I'll give you my best technical and fundamental reader. So please get those requests rolling in, Zoomers. I have a few already coming in. Colin was first in today. So NASDAQ, we've been watching this one for a while, haven't we? We know that wonderful long-term uptrend went a bit funky over here, didn't it? Uh, we broke down. The traffic light system told us to be very cautious through uh, January, February 2022. Seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, and then we were very much in the bear market by around April. That's about a year ago. Uh, it'd be nice if we bookended, isn't it? We go April con confirming a bear market and April here potentially confirming a bull market. We're not there. We're, we're doing a great deal of work. And that is we're pushing above the long-term trend ribbon, which we know has been acting as a, a really solid area of resistance. And you can see just how much influence it's having right now on, on recent price action. Uh, we need to get above it and stay above it. And that's what we're doing. So that's a, that's a good first sign. Uh, we're looking at the price action now. And let me zoom in a little bit and draw it in for you. I'm going peak to trough here. And uh, peak to trough is actually the rules are, are rock solid. Higher highs and higher lows. So this candle here and this candle here, uh, that is a short term uptrend. And then if you get a lower high and a lower low, you can see that on these tech candles. So this candle, it's high is lower than that high and this low is lower than that low. So that's our peak uh, because that's a short term downtrend. And then we check it off again. And now we go up because we've got higher highs and higher lows. And we just go in on that pattern and draw in our peaks and troughs. And there's going to be one there and there and there and there and there and we don't have another one yet but if we do get the lower high and lower low tonight we will actually be doing something like this and i'm being a bit presumptuous there but the strength of that uh, black candle that supply candle the probability is the highest that we do actually get a, another bearish candle tonight it would be I'm not saying a miracle but it would not be in line with the probability I would expect from that candle to have an up session tonight. So probably we'll get the lower peak and lower trough uh, coming in here, which is a little bit annoying and frustrating and disturbing, uh, but not surprising given that this level was just so rock solid, wasn't it? We wanted to see a close above that. We never got it. Okay, so next few sessions, we're not talking about the next few months, next few sessions, I think the bias is towards the downside. Where, where do we pick up the pieces if you're a bull? Uh, well, the trend zones are a really good place to start. So the, the short term uptrend is in place and we could, should see it act as a short term dynamic support zone. So we're looking for white candles in that light green zone. Uh, failing that, then we really want to see uh, the white candles come in in that long term zone. But we are very sideways. And that is, I think, going to be the theme. The market cannot make up its mind. And if the market cannot make up its mind, then you have to question your ability to commit one way or the other in terms of risk on or risk off, in terms of adding risk here or keeping that cash safe in the bank somewhere, in your in your trading account, not in the market, okay, not at risk. Uh, let's head over to the A6200, which was Colin's request. And to be fair, actually, given the big black candle on the NASDAQ, uh, also here, the Russell engulfed, that black candle engulfed the previous day's white candle, the S&P 500, um, also an engulfing candle there. I think we're holding up really well today, all things considered. So that's really encouraging. When you expect there's going to be some supply in the market and it doesn't manifest itself, it speaks to the, the fact that people, uh, investors, who have stock, who have risk, 
are actually more comfortable today in maintaining that risk than you thought. Okay, why, why aren't they selling? Okay, well, they're not as scared perhaps as maybe that black candle uh, would, into, would uh, lead a technical analyst to be. So that's, that's, that's good, even if there isn't a great deal of demand in the system today. And there probably isn't, given how tiny that candle is. Uh, and really, I know this candle's still live, but look at that, just a smidgen of volume. We, we, there's very little commitment here one way or the other. So again, indicating that if you're out there feverishly applying risk today, I don't think that is warranted given the current market situation. We did hit, look at that, smack bang on the dot. We hit the old point of supply. That's this one here, so 73, 71. That's a, a clear point of supply. And uh, the high we ended up getting was 73, 70.1. So slightly lower. But yeah, look, I, I don't think these candles are so sinister to suggest that we uh, must have a pullback, I think. Uh, at worst, they say holding pattern in the interim. Okay, Where I think I could measure it, but I think we're a little bit closer to the top of the range than we are to the bottom range. I think that's also a positive jumping on to something like the, uh, the Think Markets platform, for example do have it here on screen so you can see you've got the chart. Uh, if you open this, you can actually start to place a trade. Not that I think we need to, unless you actually wanted to short it uh, for tonight. But I think that's 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 a little bit brave at this stage. And of course, the ASX 200 is also something you can trade. So just opening your eyes to this possibility that, well, I can try and find out of the 2,500 stocks something to trade, or if I think the index is going somewhere, I can actually trade the index. And I just literally pop, pop this up or down to determine in this line here how much I want a points move in that index to represent in my PL. And if I think it's going up 100 points and I think I should make 100 bucks, or let's think of it in terms of risk, I think it's going up 100, but it might go down 50, and I'm only comfortable losing 50 bucks. Well, then, you know, the PIP cost is a dollar. Uh, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Let's uh, keep moving. Then we've got uh, Brent crude oil for Hanelli coming up. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, was it a couple of weeks ago? Was it might have just even been last week. Uh, I know on crude oil, uh, we were contemplating a long on crude oil. And it was around this level here where we said, you know, it's very cheeky. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but on the basis of all of these arrows I drew in the chart and, and the strength of those candles, I said, look, there's something going on here. There, there's really, really... Um, this is not your normal kind of low. This is a very solid low. And look, I know it's against the trend, but it's 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 very cheeky. Just dip a little toe in the water. Um, I didn't know, and there's no way I could have known that uh, OPEC was going to have that surprise um, cut of 1.1 million barrels, and that did send the price up. Um, and then we said uh, maybe maybe that was two weeks ago in here. And then last week we said, well, if we get a little bit of a pullback, we've seen um, it move into the supply zone. And if we see just a, a very shallow pullback after this gap, and gap gap ups are very, very powerful technical analysis signals. And the old theory, and it's incorrect, if you read a technical analysis textbook one time, like many experts have, uh, they say that gaps must be filled. And I say that's just rubbish. And they often view gaps as, as I guess, bearish is that the right way to put it? that that gaps are bearish in that there's a gap and the price needs to come down to fill that gap and i think that's just bubkas they're not thinking about supply and demand the only way you can you can get a gap is if there is this this tectonic shift in the demand side equilibrium or lack thereof uh, we all of a sudden there's so much more demand and so much less supply that price just shoves and when i say tectonic shift like an earthquake uh, and that means something that's not meaningless and you don't just undo that uh, so i love gaps i love uh, gap ups and then i'm looking for the prolonged response from the market so if they didn't get on that day are they then changing their minds and what you want to see after that big gap and it's the same for a big white candle a, a, a big gap if you blend this candle here and this candle here it's just a big white candle and that's all the gap is and i think people say oh gaps have to be filled they're missing the point that a gap is the same as a big white candle they'll tell you oh gaps have to be filled but big white candles are bullish no no they're, they're the same thing so if there's a very um a very limited supply side response and this is what I would have been talked about last week, I think, but go check the tape, is that if we get this shallow supply side response and then we throw in the right candle, 
which is that white candle there, you can add another third to this position. And I think that's where you're at. And I'm guessing Anelli's asking the question because Anelli's probably done it. Um, I think this candle here is really another one third. I, don't, I, don't, I can't see why you wouldn't look at that and say, uh, that was supposed to copy. <laughs> I guess I didn't paste. Let's do clone. There we go. This is actually quite clever, this um, trading view platform. I'm not an expert on drawing in this, but it, it does all the stuff you need it to do. Uh, so happy to add even a third based upon that candle. Okay, so that constitutes you know, a, a, a starting full position, but that doesn't mean we can't continue to add and add and add as um, the, the trend warrants. Uh, am I worried about this 9360 zone? A little bit. Yeah, I am a little bit. But I think uh, if we're adding a third here, and the stop I think now is coming just under the gap because we don't want to see the gap price move back into the gap. The gap represents demand, a tectonic shift in demand. And if we're trading back in that gap, what does it mean for all that demand? It means it's either under pressure or it's gone. Uh, so with a stop sort of in that gap zone and you know an entry around here, I think we've got at least one to one on uh, this addition here. So yeah, there's nothing in this which would tell me that I shouldn't uh, continue to favour this one and add some risk. And I know, Hanelli, you did ask about Brent, uh, and I'm just going to go ditto from that. Obviously, the, the crude, West Texas crude oil and the Brent charts are going to look very, very similar. Um, having said that, there is a little bit of a supply zone here on Brent that's not there on, on West Texas crude. Uh, and I'll leave it up to you whether that bothers you. But I think on the, on the strength, again, of the price action, the moves and the candles, I'm, I'm a happy holder here on the long side. Okay, let's go to SNX, which is in the crypto universe. And very easy for me to find it here. Just head over there to that watch list. And we're going to scroll down. I'm in alphabetical order. And we're going to go to SNX. There we go. Uh, which is looking a bit boring there, unfortunately, Craig. It's looking a bit like my Neo, which I maybe I'll talk about next. And I don't think there's enough excitement here, really, to get this going. It's not awful, no. You know, it's in that long-term uh, trend zone, that ribbon that it's, I guess, struggling to dispense with. I don't want to see it move below that ribbon because it could be indicating maybe that the long-term downtrend is actually still in, in play. It's just been pausing. But if you've got it, or can I see a path to holding it? I just think it's really boring. If you don't have it, I don't think you need to buy it. If you've got it, do you need to sell it? Oh, look, I can see demand through here, 240, you know, below 240. Uh, it's starting to look a bit shaky. And this level here, certainly below 228, I think um, the story's got very cold for the time being. But does, I guess, raise the question, what, what does look good in crypto? And I will go to Neo because I thought that looked good a few days ago. And look, it's holding. I mean, it. Uh, you can see this sort of, um, this this pent up sort of um, pennant pattern here that I was looking at. And I must admit, I got in on this candle here. It was actually on, on this candle here, but on the basis of this candle, and it just opened a little bit lower by the time I, I saw it very early in the new candle. And uh, for me, that just means I'm getting in at a discount. That's all it means. Uh, and I added, uh, you know, again, a third in, in line with what I usually put on my crypto trades. Uh, and I haven't added another third since then. So I'm a bit disappointed. Uh, beneath this level here at 11.50, uh, let's call it 11.50, I, I will be tossing out that one third and um, taking my licks on that one and trying to find something else that uh, is looking good. One that does look good is another one I do own, and I, and I haven't done a big um, scan of crypto lately, to be honest. I tend to obviously look at the ones that I do own each day to see if I've got an exit signal. Uh, but Phantom, I think, looks very, very good. And uh, yeah, I think it still looks pretty good today. I, if I was to get out of Neo, I'd probably whack it on this one. Based upon what I can see there, I can't see why you couldn't add a little bit of risk onto that one as well. One of the better looking crypto charts at the moment. Uh, should I get to the next one of my holdings that looks very, very good? They're, they're few and far between, let me assure you. Uh, but my Ethereum, which is my, my biggest crypto position, I still think is very much intact and still looks fine. I know we're in the shadow of that 20 sort of uh, 30 region there. But otherwise, the price action, the candles, the trends all look very, very good. And then, of course, uh, just going through the list of my holdings here, Bitcoin, uh, not in any particular order, uh, still looks very good. And I'm, ha I'm a happy holder here and uh, did indicate might have been last week or the week before that I was, you know, just looking for opportunities to add risks. So I'm pretty happy with the way that one's going and I don't think I need to 
uh, reduce any of my risk on that at this time. And I think that's the extent of the ones that look good in my crypto wallet at this point in time. So maybe we'll keep moving on. Uh, and Ellie asking for iron ore. Let us do that one. I think I've, I had a request coming through from Nick as well for uh, the Aussie dollar, which we'll do after iron ore. Let us head uh, back to the Amy Broker chart because that's where my favourite iron ore contract lives. And you might be wondering, hey Carl, why uh, why aren't you uh, on the Think Markets platform uh, doing that? Well, uh, the Think Markets platform is is very very good. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have um, the ability to annotate the charts like I can do in those other platforms. So it does everything else in the charts. There's there's uh, literally a thousand million indicators and you can set up all the moving averages that I do. And you can, you can draw, but it's not as easy to copy and paste items, to move stuff around, to get, you know, the arrows in the right place that I can do. And this, these these sessions are about drawing and, and, and writing, you know, on the screen and demonstrating. So that's the only reason why I'm not in there. And it might be in the other ones. The other reason is, um, whilst actually the ThinkMarks platform does pretty much have everything on it, um, it's it's hard to get everything in Amy Broker, which is my native environment where I like to draw. And even TradingView doesn't have everything on it either. So for example, I can't get this chart in TradingView, uh, which is sh uh, Shanghai Iron Ore, and that's my preferred contract to look at. Um, I prefer to look at this one over even the Singapore contract, which is the one that, that's most quoted on the news. Uh, you can't see it, but now you can. And this is the iron ore contract I like to look at. So this is Shanghai Iron Ore, and the price is in yuan per tonne, compared to, say, the Singapore-based contract, which is in US dollars per tonne. Okay, so uh, look, I think, I mean, last week we were talking about this idea of uh, this lower point of supply. Okay, so this point point of supply here uh, was concerning because of its relationship to that one and, and this one up here is more and more looking like a major point of supply a, a really important level that will I believe impede uh, up, upside momentum uh, for for the foreseeable future and it was really the first time for a very long time that we unequivocally have moved into a period where you know points of supply are, are declining and points of demand are declining and what that means in plain speak is that you know demand is diminishing and supply is increasing and that's not good if you are placed towards the long side but um, since our last update we've actually managed to log a little higher pod there so that's impressive and when that higher pod comes in and around that long-term trend zone that dark green zone that's also uh, very impressive so uh, I don't think I gave you a, a bearish bias last week I think I said it was very neutral and I think there's case to be even more neutral this week but undoing some of I guess the uh, the you know, the, the concern we had last week that it was really going to roll over through 844 and see. And if it got through 844, it could be quite a quite a precipitous fall. Uh, but I think the demand we've seen come in is, is, is encouraging that we're at least going to go sideways at the worst. But it does increase the possibility also that we do push through 915. And if we get through 915, then we could go back and, and test 965, which I think is going to be a significant issue, as I said. So neutral, is there a trade there? Now, look, I can't see the trade, but it means if you translate that back to your BHP, your Rio and your Fortescue, that there's, you maybe don't have to be as proactive as managing your exits on those. Okay, as I promised, we're going to head to the Australian dollar versus the US dollar next. Don't forget... Well, we can cover anything you want to cover in the world of macro today. Uh, so cu uh, currencies, indices, commodities, crypto. Let's now just take a second to look at this one. So obviously we had the uh, couple of big data points last night. We had the CPI in the US coming better than expected. Uh, that is lower than expected. So less inflation, less need for the Fed to aggressively raise interest rates. And all of FX works like this. Basically, the higher the yield uh, in a particular country, the greater the return in that country's risk-free assets vis-a-vis -vis their bonds, their government bonds, okay? Uh, now, not all government bonds are considered by markets to be risk-free, but certainly the big ones, your US Treasury notes and, and Treasury bonds, T notes, T bonds, they are considered to be risk free assets. Okay. The market says that Uncle Sam will always pay us back no matter what. The Bank of Japan 
risk-free uh, assets on the uh, Japanese government bonds, the JGBs they're called. And then we've got the UK gilts, another risk-free asset. You could even say uh, the Swiss uh, bonds would also be risk-free. And dare I even say the Australian bonds are risk-free, okay? And what this means is if it's all about parking cash and there's plenty of cash around because the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, they spent about, what, 10 years, 12 years printing money. So FX more than ever is working based upon relative yields. And if you can park your money risk-free at a higher yield in one currency and you and what you probably do is finance it in the other currency. So the Australian, um, we know the Australian cash rate is about 3.6%. We know in, the, in America, you're getting closer to 4.8%. So what people will want to do is uh, borrow in Australian dollars and use those Australian dollars to buy US dollars. And through the exchange rate, that will then depress the Australian dollar, US dollar exchange rate. Okay, and this is why the Aussie dollar we know has been under significant pressure. And it took a turn for the worse based upon... Uh, some, uh, well, it would be, it'd be Reserve Bank, isn't it? Australian Reserve Bank uh, saying that, saying things like, you know, that's it, we're, we're, we're getting close to a pause and things like that. Uh, but yeah, look, uh, that's for, for that reason, you know, if we look at really big picture, you're, you're not thinking about going long the Australian dollar uh, unless you saw the most amazing technical signals. And we're not seeing those. Uh, we're seeing very much long-term downtrend, short-term trend impeding upwards price action. And what could change this around? Well, US dollar weakness uh, could change that. And the, uh, the assumption that uh, as I said, about 4.8% US rates, that the Federal Reserve is going to cut those rates towards the end of the year. And the market is baking in around about, you know, somewhere between 50 and 75 basis points worth of cuts. The uh, Jerome Powell said, that's not our base case. The market's got it wrong. Somebody's going to be right, either Jerome Powell or the market. Um, even if they were to get those cuts, we're still going to see the Australian dollar, uh, the US dollar, uh, the US dollar rate or the uh, Federal Reserve rate settle closer to 4% with the Aussie dollar rate settling closer to 3.5%, okay, based upon end of year expectations. Uh, the expectation is that the Reserve Bank will cut rates by 25 basis points before the end of this year. So we're still going to have that 50 basis point discrepancy in favour of the US dollar. And long story short, because I know that was a long story, it's hard to see the Aussie dollar overcome that. To go along the Aussie dollar, you would need a severe recession in the USA, uh, which probably wouldn't help the Aussie dollar because if there's a severe recession in the USA, there's a more severe recession everywhere else and people are going to sell the Aussie dollar because it's a risk asset. Uh, I can't see any reason to be along the Aussie dollar right now. Uh, above 67.93, something's happened in the world, all right, to, 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 swing, to swing that balance more towards lower long-term rates in the US than in Australia. But I can't see it right there, right now. Uh, and that's a nice little segue into the next one. Uh, Craig's asking for the US dollar versus the Japanese yen. It's pretty sideways there, Craig. I don't think there's a lot to do. I can see certainly this candle here is very interesting. And we've had a, a pretty a pretty shallow response so far. And I could see if we can close above this high here, uh, which is 134.05. Let's call it 134.05 then I could see scope to move a little higher into this. So we're seeing appreciation of the US dollar there. That's probably, that'd, that'd be one of the stronger looking charts for the US dollar against the other currencies, I would suggest. I tweeted this morning the lithium charts. So I'll just do a quick comment on that while you're getting your last request in. We're still heading down in this. Now, long-term downtrend, I'm going to suggest because you can see here the main trend has, uh, ribbon has gone to, dark pink so officially there you go officially uh, the bear market lithium has begun by that measure uh, but we were well ahead of the curve there in predicting this in fact i think you could go back probably around here uh, where i told you the bull market in lithium is over unequivocally the bull market in lithium is over and look at that that's in january and go go check the, the recordings there on youtube where i said uh, did you just see the top in lithium now, it, we could see a little bit of demand coming in there around about 180. It's, it's an old uh, previous area of supply. It could act as demand in the future. We haven't seen any price action to suggest that's the case. And if we do fail in this sort of 170 to 180 area, there's really not a lot holding lithium up until we get into the 80,000s. Uh, now, the problem here for lithium carbonate is that we have had at the end, obviously, of uh, some 
subsidies for the purchase of electric vehicles in China. That's that is old news now, but it is why ultimately demand for lithium batteries had come off. There were large stockpiles of lithium carbonate for battery manufacturers to work through. Why were there large stockpiles? Because look at the price, they've been building them up in anticipation that prices were going to go up. That didn't happen. Uh, so they stopped buying lithium carbonate effectively to work through those stockpiles. Uh, and all reports are that they are working through those stockpiles. So that may be also something to alleviate that problem with uh, lithium carbonate, or the, or the temporary medium, short to medium term oversupply in China. And it's really a China-centric problem is what we're seeing here for lithium prices. The other uh, thing that occurred with those high prices is that uh, there was more incentive to go for these sort of non-conventional uh, lithium uh, minerals like lipidolite. So as, as a non-conventional means of, of extracting your lithium minerals, particularly refined or into lithium carbonate, and that was a big overhang as well. So the residual impact is that lithium hydroxide prices have broken down and therefore, no doubt, you're going to see some of those contracting prices for spodumene also come under severe pressure. And once the top's in, and this is kind of the problem, once the top's in, you know, prices can fall because it's, well, we'll accept a bit less, we'll accept a bit less. We're still making great money. You know, it's, I mean, suppliers are still making supersized profits here. So that is the problem for lithium prices at this point in time. And I could easily see we, we're breaking through 50 here. You can see uh, the line chart there through 50. 37, you know, 40 looks like a lock to me. And then maybe we see a bounce from there. All things considered, I think, you know, Aussie lithium stocks are holding up pretty well. I know you're going to say, hey, Carl, that's not fair. They're, they're getting smashed. But oh, well, I think, yeah, they're going down. But I think considering what could happen, they're actually holding up pretty well. Okay, uh, I don't think we could not do a session uh, without the favourites. And they've come in silver, obviously, from Pinelli. And I was about to head to gold, but let's do silver first. And uh, let's go here with the candlesticks. Uh, I said to you last week, I prefer it to gold. I think it looks great. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's doing its thing. 2621 to 2694, that's the zone. I can't see why we can't get there. Now, the other thing you can do here, you can trade silver here. So XAGUSD. And if you think silver's going up, Adriatic Metals is the top pick I gave I gave you. Yeah, big silver project coming online before the end of the year, but that share price has gone down. And if you if you went and bought ADT based upon my um, you know suggestion that, oh, well, silver's going, hey, silver looks really good. Is This is a silver stock. I'm sure in the same breath I said, look, you know, if you think silver's going to buy silver, and you're seeing the result of that now, you've lost money on a silver stock, and yet silver continues its charge. And once again, if you don't know how to do it, you should know how to do it, because you're here, ultimately, to make money any way you can, to grow your capital any way you can, assuming you understand the risks, of course, and how to do it. And again, it's just saying, well, what, what am I prepared to risk here? If I think, um, you know, I'm going to bug out below 24 bucks, how many pips is that? And, and I can see my pip cost. I can go down as little as 75 cents a pip, okay, to be involved in this. Uh, so once again, if you're not trading the actual commodities, if you've got a bunch of gold stocks, to be fair, you've done pretty well. But I still say, that you know, if you think gold's going up by gold, if you think copper's going up uh, by copper, it's a very, very simple message. Okay, so we are doing silver chart hold at risk. Looks amazing. No complaints from me. In terms of gold, it doesn't look as strong. We can see that. And I think 2070 is far more influential here. But I think it's okay. I think you can continue to hold on to it. And especially considering one other thing here. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but this will make sense. Uh, this chart here which is of the uh, US dollar index, which broke down last night. Or it's just about to break down. It looks like it's in dire straits. So the further down this index goes, uh, the higher gold and silver should go. Less important for copper. Okay, so copper is less seen as this long-term um, store of value potentially uh, as, 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 a, as a precious metal that you can you know buy a bunch of it, lock it up in a vault. Uh, copper is still considered to be uh, primarily an industrial metal, but it will benefit from a fall in the US dollar. We're starting to see, you can see last night's candle on the US dollar, and you can see how that has caused almost really the equal and opposite candle on, on copper. I actually think this is starting to look pretty good here. And I'm, you know, I'm not a big trend line drawer, but there, there is certainly an area here, a dynamic area of, of, of supply. 
uh, where the price is sort of increasingly uh, impeding. And if we can close above that, I think that's very positive. But you know, even if I draw a horizontal line across and look at that high there at say 415, um, that's pretty good. On the strength of this candle here, I'm happy to go. So the strength of this candle, this higher trough, and the long-term uptrend is holding, I'm actually happy to go a plus a third here. Okay, so let's go plus one third. And it's it's a little bit of a cheeky third. It's a, it's a little bit of an, an aggressive one. And then I would suggest if we could get above uh, this level here, uh, 4.15, uh, then we can uh, add the next third. Okay, so through here, uh, we're going to go clone and plus the third there and then you'd be looking at something up here really for your or your final potentially uh, add in point so if we could chart out what we want to do on copper and we can uh, leave those scratchings on screen and come back to them in the future that is what we're thinking here okay uh, so adding some risk on high grade copper and again dead simple in doing that we just go copper and uh this is a this is a look. It's a slightly slightly bigger contract to be fair, but um, I'm sure that at a dollar forty nine a pip, and one pip being 0 0.1 of one cent, uh, because the pip is invariably the last of the big numbers here. So you can see how sixty four is is made bigger. The pip is always the last one of those, or the rightmost one of those digits is the pip value. So if we go from four oh six four to four oh six five, uh, we're going to make a uh, dollar fifty if we're going long. If we go from four oh six four to four oh six three, we're going to lose a dollar fifty. And again, it's just about massaging that number to manage uh, your risk. And you know, stops for me are going underneath that low there, uh, which is if I do the crosshairs, will show up very quickly. Uh, that low there is three ninety three. So setting probably at sort of three ninety one ish, or if you wanted to go, be really conservative. If you're going under there, um, and then you can say, well, if I've you know, what is that? What is that worth to me in uh, in pips and times that by a dollar fifty? And this is in Australian dollars as well, assuming your account is denominated in Aussie dollars. Nicola, can I look at coal? Certainly can, Nicola. Now, unfortunately, this is one we don't have on the platform, and I wish we did. Uh, you can see we've got Whitehaven coal. That lot of good that'll do you, unless you wanted to go short and Warrior Met coal. I don't even know what that one is, uh, but uh, oh, yes, I will petition. It wouldn't be great if we could trade coal as well. Let us head then over to the trading view and the contracts we're looking for. If you want to do this at home, yeah, that's what this is about, giving you the tools to do this at home. NCF. Now, you could go for the spot month contract, the NCF1 exclamation mark. Uh, I do find it's a bit a bit sketchy and a bit jittery. Uh, so I go for the, the next month out, okay, which is obviously NCF2 exclamation mark, and these are continuous contracts. So as the next uh, front month becomes the next front month, then um, they, they join up the charts and back adjust them. Uh, so the price of coal at the moment, around about $200, Nicola, a ton. It seems to have found a bit of a level here, and that's good. And really, I think that's probably the best case scenario for lithium, lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide, uh, because coal was ahead of the curve. We picked that well before. And I think lithium will end up doing something like coal. It'll come down and it'll hover and wobble around that. And then it could be three months, it could be six months, it could be 12 months, it could be never. But then we'll see where it wants to go next, whether it curls back up. Maybe coal's doing that very early stages. You can, you can see the short-term trend has gone back into that amber base. Okay, so it's not it's not a downtrend anymore. It's sort of it's it's not an uptrend, it's just you know, indeterminate at this stage, long-term trend is still down. Uh, so lithium may be six months time starting to curl back up. Maybe it starts the next lithium bull market. And hey, I'll be all over it then. But until then, we don't know where it's going to make uh, make a base, let alone, you know, stop its, uh, its demise. Uh, so flat at best there on coal for you, Nicola. I don't uh, think until we see some price action that returns more. And you know what I like to see when I see the this sort of price action, which is it's possible. Um, but then we also will have to deal with this. Okay, so we're a long way away from saying, oh, well, we, we can add some risk necessarily, and we'll look at each coal stock in isolation because we can't trade it on the Think Markets platform. This is from Tanya. We're looking at nickel next. And I don't think I have nickel on here, but I certainly have it over here. And uh, I've got all the London Metals Exchange ones here. So let us do that. We might as well just flick through uh, LME prices 
and I'll make sure I've got the latest update there because they come through a little bit later in the morning. Yep, and we do have. So they are current as of yesterday's London close. Uh, so price of aluminium. I wonder if you knew this was the case for aluminium. Maybe you hold alumina. Uh, and the short term, uh, long term trend is very well established to the downside on aluminium. Uh, this was all of the excitement over the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And we were saying things like, oh, well, Russia has you know X amount of the global aluminium supply. And this is how trends change. Never believe a story is going to last forever. You can believe it for a while. While it's going up, believe the story. But believe the trends also, because money votes in the market. Money votes, and it, the fingerprints of that money voting is here in these trend ribbons. Uh, so long-term downtrend for aluminum, what does that tell you about the global economy? Copper reflecting obviously the high-grade copper we saw earlier on. Let's skip to nickel, which was the request here. Uh, now nickel maybe making a little bit of a double bottom there. Doesn't look as bad as aluminium, but still very much a short-term downtrend and the long-term trend is flat to down also. Uh, if we can close above that high there, which is to 24,200, then maybe nickel is having a bit of a go, okay? But until we close above 24,200, that is the key level. If you didn't catch it, 24,200. Uh, there's nothing to see or do here on nickel. Let's keep an eye out for that one. Uh, lead, flat, tin, actually looks pretty darn awful. And zinc, is probably the worst of the lot of them, okay? And if you've got South 32, I just went through the you know top three things that South 32 does. Okay, so again, this is why we're here on Thursdays. We're looking at these key macro charts to understand what's going on in our portfolios. Okay, that's the bottom of the list today. And I think we might adjourn there. I think that's a good place to uh, move on today. Thanks for joining me, of course. I know everybody here also does the Tuesday sessions for the ASX. Uh, where we look at all ASX stocks and ETFs. But we do have a USA edition as well, which I'm going to run tomorrow, where we are going to look at your Apples, your IBMs, your Microsofts, your General Electrics of the world. And certainly if, not if, but when the next big bull market begins, we know nobody does a bull market quite like the Americans. And I do think if you are going to be stuck in your four banks and your three resource stocks, you're going to be very disappointed because the USA will leave us, you know, in its wake. We'll be in the dust there. Uh, so get on board with that one. Uh, well, I think markets, of course, we are the best in the business. We're the good guys. Uh, we have everything you need to trade. Over 3,100 shares in ETFs, $8 flat rate, pin and chess sponsored. And if you're trading CFDs, which is what we talked about today, FX, indices, commodities, futures, crypto, everything we looked at today is commission-free and they are market best spreads. We are an award-winning broker. We keep getting nominated. We keep winning them because we have the best platforms and the best customer service. You can actually talk to someone. How about that? Uh, thinkmarkets.com forward slash au to open up an account. Uh, if you're watching on any of the streaming services, again, apologies, you couldn't be here live today. Uh, catch the Zoom, obviously, registration I showed you before, but please uh, hit the like button or subscribe also. That's it for me today. Hopefully you enjoyed the session. Apologies for the um, technical difficulties, and, but all the best if you're trading until we catch up again. Bye-bye for now. Before you go, everything we discussed today is general in nature, has not taken into account your personal financial circumstances or particular needs. So before acting upon any of this general advice, please consider it carefully or seek the help of a financial professional. The rest of the information in this disclaimer is important. You should read it, or if you have any questions or comments, please get in touch with us via our website and download our product disclosure statement, our PDS.